Hey, April. Yeah, Simon. What washes up on really small beaches? I don't know, Simon. What washes up on really small beaches? Microwaves. Micro. <laughs> I have nothing. <laughs> That's true. So, That's certainly true. That's certainly true. Okay. <laughs> I like that one. Hi, everybody. This is Simon Majumda, and welcome to a brand new episode of Eat My Globe, a podcast about things you didn't know you didn't know about food. And on today's very special episode, I want to pay tribute not only to some of the inventors that have changed the way we eat, but also the discoverers who work in science and engineering over the centuries have helped make our food not only safer to eat, but also considerably easier to prepare. For our purposes, I am distinguishing inventors as those who have created equipment, while discoverers are those who have defined concepts. So today, on Eat My Globe, let's tip an historical hat in the direction of two perfect examples of discoveries. So let's begin with an invention that at best might be considered by people, chefs in particular, as polarising. One that some people see as having a definite purpose and others as the pinging enemy in the corner of the kitchen, only to be used to resuscitate the forgotten morning beverage when discovered later in the day. It is a piece of equipment that, at one point, was expected to become the centrepiece of the modern kitchen, but although it still appears in most people's homes, it is one they point to with a look of guilt that says, I just use it for reheating stuff. And yet, it is a piece of equipment that I think can still play a useful part in the kitchen, once we understand how it works and what it is really designed to achieve. Yes, of course, on the first segment of today's episode of Eat My Globe is on that often much maligned piece of equipment, the microwave oven. Now, usually on Eat My Globe, when we begin to talk about something, we start with a definition so we can be very clear what it is that we're going to be discussing. In the case of the microwave oven, though, this is a little more complex, as not only do we need to look at the definition of the oven itself and see how that was developed, but we also need to look at the definition of a microwave itself to see when these were first discovered and how they first began to be used in the context of preparing food. So why don't we begin with the microwaves themselves? Our chums at the Cambridge Dictionary define microwaves as, quote, a very short electromagnetic wave used for cooking food or for sending information by radio or radar, end quote. They define the microwave oven as, quote, an electric oven that uses waves of energy to cook or heat food quickly, end quote. But first, I think it makes sense to look at the discovery and history of the microwave before we begin to look at the impact it has had on our food. For this, we have to look back to the mid and late 1800s for the theoretical and then practical proof that such microwaves existed, and then to the 1940s and to a self-taught scientist and inventor by the name of Percy Spencer. Oh, and to the melting of a peanut butter candy bar. Stay with me. In 1873, Scottish scientist James Clark Maxwell declared in a book that is now considered pivotal in the study of energy, Treaties on Electricity and Magnetism, that electromagnetic waves could be created in a laboratory. And in 1887, his theory was finally able to be demonstrated by another of the great names of science, German physicist Henrik Hertz. Those of you who recognise the name may recall that the unit of frequency of these microwaves was given his name in recognition, the Hertz. However, while both of these illustrious scientists were able to theorise and demonstrate microwaves, it was not until our next food hero came along that we see a real move from scientific debate to kitchen usage. Percy Spencer is another one of those amazing people that we encounter on Eat My Globe during our regular journey through food history. 
Born in 1894 in the small rural New England town called Howland, Maine, Spencer came from a poor family and, and didn't have much formal education. He never completed grammar school. But despite these setbacks, Percy Spencer had an innate sense of trying to figure things out. And at the age of only 12, the fifth grade, he left what schooling he was receiving and managed to get a job at one of the local spool mills that had sprung up in the area to which he was born. He also took other odd jobs when his father died, and his mother sent him to live with an aunt who was a nomadic weaver. At the age of 16, he found himself signing up for work on the installation of electricity for the first time at another paper mill. Although he had little or no formal schooling, and had no idea how this relatively new power source worked, he found himself being fascinated by it. Within days spent working on it, and nights spent looking at relevant textbooks, he was very soon a skilled electrical mechanic. Apparently, he was so inspired by reading about the radio operators that had worked to try and save the Titanic, don't forget we have two great episodes on the last meals served on the Titanic, that he joined the United States Navy so he could be like them. At the age of only 18, while working as a radio operator when on duty, he spent all of his downtime in self-study and managed to become knowledgeable in calculus, chemistry, metallurgy, physics and trigonometry. He later declared, quote, I just got hold of a lot of textbooks and taught myself while I was standing watch at night, end quote. It was after he left the Navy at the end of World War I in 1925 that Percy Spencer comes into our line of food history. Not that he was intending to. He joined a company in Cambridge, Massachusetts, named the American Appliance Company. Its name later changed to one that many of you might now know by its current name, Raytheon. While there, Spencer's reputation began to grow and grow, a reputation that many of his colleagues put down to his initial lack of education, with one saying, quote, The educated scientist knows many things won't work. Percy doesn't know what can't be done, end quote. And Vannevar Bush, the founder of Raytheon, once declared that Spencer, quote, earned the respect of every physicist in the country, not only for his ingenuity, but for what he has learned about physics by absorbing it through his skin, end quote. And by the approach of World War II, he was Raytheon's most reliable troubleshooter, particularly when it came to working on the development of a British invention, the combat radar. This war-winning device was dependent upon the mass production of a key component, the cavity magnetron. Now that reference might sound like an album by 1970s band Hawkwind, there's a reference for the teenagers, but so vital was the cavity magnetron and so important to the Allied war effort that for that and his other efforts during the war, Spencer was awarded the Distinguished Public Service Award by the US Navy. It is the highest award the Navy can award to a civilian. Now, this is all very splendid, but I can hear some of you ask, what the heck does any of this have to do with me heating up my morning coffee? Well, it's a good question, and was the result of an accident that happened to Percy Spencer in 1945, while he was working on the magnetrons for the radars. He noticed that the microwaves that powered the magnetrons had caused a peanut butter candy bar in his pocket to melt. The candy bar was not for him to eat, and according to his grandson, Rod Spencer Jr., his grandfather used it to feed squirrels and chipmunks during his lunch break. Now, you might be wondering whether it was safe for Percy Spencer to have been so close to the microwaves that caused his candy to melt. According to popular mechanics, microwaves are considered safe, and in the context of when Spencer noticed his candy bar melting, quote, people would wear nuclear stuff around their neck to get rid of cancer. End quote. So there's that. Soon after he noticed his candy melt, Percy Spencer being Percy Spencer, he immediately began to think about what may have caused this and decided to try this again. This time, he used kernels of corn. And that, my friends, is the day microwave popcorn was born. But it gets better. According to Percy's grandson, Rod, Percy also brought in one of those ingredients that we now warn everyone never to place in a microwave, an egg in its shell, which inevitably popped, splattering the face of our inventor friend with its gooey contents. 
Not dissuaded by the egg on face faux pas, the same year, on October the 8th, 1945, Spencer filed US patent 2,495,429 for, quote, method of treating foodstuffs, end quote. Spencer and Raytheon would commercially call this new invention Rada Range. In 1947, Raytheon released the very first commercial microwave oven. It was not as huge a success as Percy Spencer or Raytheon would have wished, perhaps in part because of its cost, which was a whopping $3,000 in the 1940s. That's nearly $38,000 in today's money. Perhaps it was also to do with the size of the machine, which was nearly six feet tall in height and weighed an impressive 750 pounds. And perhaps it was because the notion of cooking something with the contents of a radar might have been rather intimidating to the regular person. Through the years, the microwave would evolve into what we are familiar with today. In 1955, Raytheon, along with another company, developed a microwave for home use. Although it sold at a reduced price of $1,295, it was still too big for the home kitchen. And in 1967, Raytheon, through its company Amana, put out a compact microwave for $495. But even then, it still did not become a commonplace item found in home kitchens. In the early 1970s, a company known as Litton Industries released two new models of microwaves as part of their own push into what they described in the New York Times as, quote, the most exciting new product since TV based on reaction in the marketplace, end quote. The article went on to say that by 1976, they expected the market for microwave ovens to reach around $750 million in the United States alone. Sure enough, as prices went down and the sizes became more compact, by 1975, microwave ovens had outsold gas ranges and stores sold one million microwaves every year. Microwaves have become so popular due to its quick way of cooking food over conventional cooking. Interestingly, according to the book Elusive Consumption, microwaves were initially intended as a brown good, that is, a range of appliances that was specifically aimed to appeal to young men, and often young single men, who did not want to spend too much time cooking. It was marketed as high technology and sold with other brown goods like video recorders and stereos. Because the sales were slow, it was remarketed as a white good, such as ovens, refrigerators, etc. In the new marketing materials, it targeted the whole family, with the assumption that women would prepare the meals, which is a fascinating background on how gendered technology and marketing could be. Saving time and energy when cooking with microwaves happened because of its very nature. Basically, a magnetron, similar to the one that Percy Spencer would have had in his laboratory, is reduced so it can fit into a much tinier electron tube. This produces the microwaves, which can then be reflected off the metal interior of the oven into the food. The microwaves cause the water particles in the food to move, and this cooks the food. So food with a lot of water, such as vegetables, can benefit from being prepared in the microwave. Now, I will hold my hand up here and say that I often use my microwave to well, blanch vegetables before adding them to other dishes on the stove. Sprouts, carrots, spinach, etc. work really, really well. One has to be careful what container to use when heating food in the microwave. Metal, for example, is a reflector of microwaves, and if a metal container is placed in a microwave, it could reflect the electrical waves, causing what would look like a mini thunderbolt in the area of the appliance. Although, more recent developments in microwavable packaging have allowed for small amounts of thin metal foil to be used to help concentrate the microwaves on certain parts of the food, for example, the crust of a pizza. The market for microwave ovens has continued to grow, with nearly 9 billion in sales expected for 2022 worldwide. The largest majority of that is in the United States, with nearly 13.5 million units being sold in 2019, with countries in Europe like Germany, Spain, France and Great Britain being the next biggest buyers, although considerably less than the United States. With the increased sale of microwaves, 
became the inevitable supply of products designed specifically to be prepared for this new piece of equipment. Popcorn, one of the first food items that Percy Spencer trialed, has become one of the great microwave staples. This was fueled not only by the ubiquity of microwaves, but also by the trend of the 1980s towards healthy eating. Popcorn, particularly the unbuttered kind, was seen as a healthy snack alternative to other foods. Pillsbury introduced the first microwavable popcorn in 1982, with the current market leader, Orville Redenbacher, issuing their first product to the market in 1983. According to the Popcorn Board, yes, there, there is such a thing, the average American currently eats around 43 quarts of popcorn every year, which includes the microwavable variety. Also, we begin to see the development of kitchen gadgets that were meant to be used in the new cooking appliance. You only need to look online now to see that there is a whole new range of equipment that is designed for those who use the microwave for more than just warming their coffee in the morning. These include pieces of equipment to help you cook bacon, cakes, pasta and many more. While hundreds of microwave cookbooks began to be published two decades after the microwave's invention, by the late 1980s many bemoaned the absence of a great microwave cookbook. These initial cookbooks were produced by, as the Washington Post calls them, quote, the industry and amateur hour cookbooks where the contents of those books were left to unimaginative home economists and staffers who were guided more by market research than culinary wisdom, end quote. But soon independent cookbooks began to appear in the bookstores, which appealed across the cooking range from books by the Betty Crocker brand, the Betty Crocker Microwave Cookbook, to Microwave Cooking for One by Marie Smith, to A Man, A Can, A Microwave by David Joachim. I am certain that I have a few of these in my collection back in London. Despite this growth and the ubiquity of microwaves, certainly in an American households, it has not been a battle without challenges. Some of that was down to the initial reticence to try a new piece of equipment that was based on something that emerged from World War II radar. But just as much in the mid 2000s, it was more down to the changes in the eating habits of the American public. A desire to eat more healthily has seen a decrease in the sales of food that have been most associated with the microwave, particularly frozen meals, whose sales have dipped in the last decade or so. Also, in a world where the countertop of the kitchen has become a battleground between gourmet coffee makers and air fryers, uh, and yes, I do have one of those in case you're going to ask, and, and I love it, uh, rice cookers and high-end food processors, the microwave can look like a relic from another age. And the existing microwaves that are already out in the marketplace are already very well made and don't need altering terribly often, which limits how often people need to buy replacements. Perhaps the biggest challenge more recently has come from the growth in sales of high-end toaster ovens. Their sales are up over 80% since 2000. I have to admit, I use one of these too, in fact. I do most of my cooking in there. It may be that the microwave, after nearly 50 years, as an essential piece of kitchen equipment, is past its prime. Over 90% of US households still have one, however. Although nowadays they are increasingly built into the kitchen rather than nestling on the countertop. And with an expected sale of 81 million units by 2026, it would be fair to suggest that the death knell of the microwave oven is unlikely to be seen any time soon. So perhaps it's time to dig out those old cookbooks and see what this kitchen staple can really do. What do you think? <laughs> Hi everybody, this is Simon Majumba, the creator and host of the Eat My Globe Food History Podcast. Now, those of you who have been listening to the podcast since we began over two years ago, nearly 50 episodes so far, will know that we have never sought out sponsorship for the podcast. It's very much been a labour of love. However, along the way, a large number of people have approached us suggesting they would like to support the podcast. And so we have opened up a page on patreon.com to allow those of you who listen regularly to do just that. Any support we will get will allow us to purchase research materials, 
buy ingredients for recipes, and maybe when we can get out and about to bring you some very special in-the-field reporting. But, and this is really important, this is not just a one-way street. For varying levels of membership of our Patreon club, there will be access to fantastic Eat My Globe swag, including that incredible chopping board so many of you have written to me about. Recipes based on historical periods about which we chat each week, video shout-outs, signed pictures, and even along the way, some very special episodes just for members. So, if you've enjoyed the episodes of Eat My Globe you've listened to so far and would like us to make many more into the future, do head over to www.patreon.com slash eatmyglobe and consider taking out a membership. Any support will be much appreciated. Remember, that's www.patreon.com slash eatmyglobe. So thank you very much. Keep listening. Now that we've talked about the science behind a kitchen appliance that I suspect just about everyone would have in their house or their workplace, the microwave oven, let's turn our attention to another discovery that has had just as much, perhaps even more effect, and has changed the lives of so many people around the world. And that is pasteurization. It is a word that I suspect folks who listen to Eat My Glow will, of course, know very well. Most of you will know that the name for this food treatment is in honour of 19th century French scientist Louis Pasteur, and that the primary purpose of the treatment was related to making sure that foodstuffs, most people will think of milk or wine at this point, are safe to eat or have an extended shelf life. And we'll definitely talk about this at the end of this section. However, as always on Eat My Globe, the story goes much further back in history and brings us into contact with some really remarkable people along the way, including, of course, Mr. Pasteur himself. And again, as always on Eat My Globe, let's turn to one of our dictionary chums to make sure that we know what the subject of this segment is actually all about. Merriam-Webster defines pasteurization as, quote, partial sterilization of a substance, and especially a liquid, such as milk, at a temperature and for a period of exposure that destroys objectionable organisms without major chemical alteration of the substance, end quote. Over the years, the list of foodstuffs that have had the process of pasteurization applied to them include such items as beer, vinegar, canned goods, all kind of dairy products and wine. However, before we head to the mid-19th century to discuss the person whose name is honoured with being associated with this treatment, I think it is definitely worth heading back in time to see what the issues had been with all of these objectionable organisms before science, shall we say, had caught up with reality. And my suggestion is we can do this by looking all the way back to the very first times that humans began to form communities, growing and harvesting grains, and begin to domesticate animals such as goats, sheep and cows. Foods such as milk or dairy products, meat and grains, could be harvested and stored for later use. Our ancient ancestors began to develop systems of preserving food. Many of these are still with us today, in techniques such as chilling food in cool pits and cool waters, fermenting food, drying food, pickling food, smoking food and salting food. In the case of milk, this would mean the creation of items with a longer life, such as butter, yogurt or cheese, which could then be stored or kept cool. In an archaeological study of skeletons discovered in the region of Sudan and Kenya, it was found that people were consuming dairy almost 6,000 years ago. And in some cases, the cheeses made could be stored for quite some time. Recent archaeological evidence has found traditional cheeses still being produced by the indigenous Sami people of Scandinavia that are, quote, a hard, compact cake which may last for many years, end quote. And in Ireland, sizable pats of butter, one has been dated as far back as 3,000 years ago and weighing in at nearly 77 pounds, has been dug up from the peat bogs of the country where they were placed up to 5,000 years ago for storage. People in Europe did drink fresh milk, but given the differences in climate between countries in the north and countries in the south, it tended to be the countries in the north that drank most milk, 
as it had a longer period before natural spoilage began to take place. By the time of the ancient Greeks and Romans, these northern territories now considered the barbarians were often looked down upon because of the amount of milk they drank or the amount of dairy products they consumed. Julius Caesar was apparently horrified by how much milk the locals drank when he visited the conquered territory of Britain. And even at home in Rome, because of the short lifespan of milk in the warmer climates, it tended only to be eaten by those who lived in the farms, who raised cows and was therefore considered a drink for poor people. Oddly and tangentially, the Romans' dislike of milk and butter, which they thought of as a salve, not as a food, did not extend to cheeses, which were prized and were a significant part of the Roman diet. Pliny the Elder writes about cheeses in his book Natural History. For example, he says that putting fig juice in milk would curdle it and turn it into cheese. If you want to find out more about the history of cheese, please do go and listen to an episode I wrote about it for an earlier season. The ancient Romans were, as we know from our Eat My Globe episode on dining in ancient Rome, very partial to their wine. And wine is another product that can be pasteurised. However, as with milk, wine too suffered from spoilage. Exposure to oxygen and the lack of modern wine bottles spoiled these ancient wines very quickly. Winemakers of the time tried various techniques to try and counter this spoilage, including adding resin to the wine and ingredients such as lead, lye ash, marble dust, and a myriad collection of herbs and plants. The wines that people in these times, up to and past the fall of the Roman Empire, would have been very, very different to what we might experience today. There were improvements in wine preservation during the period of the Middle Ages, but it was not until the 12th century in China that we begin to hear of heating wine, which is very much part of the pasteurization process, being considered as a wine preservation technique. By the late 1500s to the mid-1700s, developments in science also brought an improved understanding of the world around us and to the scientific knowledge that Louis Pasteur would come to inherit. In around 1590, a Dutch father and son named Hans and Zacharias Janssen were credited with creating the first microscope. It was a compound microscope in a tube, looking rather like a telescope, rather than the desktop microscope that we might know today. It also did not have the name Microscope, a title given to it in 1625 by Giovanni Faber. And no publications about what was seen through this device remain, so we are unsure how it was used. It is not until nearly a century later, when other scientists began to develop a microscope, that is much closer to the ones we might use today. They were also the first to begin to discover the nature of what we now call bacteria, something of which Pasteur was to become very aware. English scientist Robert Hooke is perhaps best known for his theory, Hooke's Law, which discussed the elasticity of forces on an object. Now, please don't ask me to explain. I hated science at school. But in 1665, he used a primitive form of a microscope to describe the configurations of moulds. Dutch scientist Antony van Leeuwenhoek is perhaps more important for our conversation. In 1676, he discovered the existence of bacteria. He described bacteria as those, quote, very little animalcules, end quote. He was also a microscope maker, and in his lifetime he ground down almost 500 lenses, many of which now reside in the collection of the Royal Society in England. In 1768, an Italian priest and scientist named Lazzaro Spallanzani began to develop experiments so pivotal to the cause that Encyclopaedia Britannica suggests, quote, his investigations into the development of microscopic life in nutrient culture solutions paved the way for the research of Louis Pasteur, end quote. In a series of experiments, Spallanzani boiled gravy in vials and immediately sealed them. The results showed that microorganisms didn't grow inside, so those microorganisms must be living organisms that came from the air. After Spallanzani, we pass by two gentlemen that I have discussed in a bit more detail 
on a very early episode of Eat My Globe on the history of spam. Yes, I did say spam. If you've not yet listened to it, it might be worth checking out, particularly as a good part of the episode is all about the development of the science of canning food, both by former champagne bottler Nicolas Appert, who canned tomatoes into glass containers to feed Napoleon's army, and by Peter Durand, who did a similar task but using tin cans rather than glass. Do go and give it a listen. The reason I mention all these folks in something of a whirlwind fashion is to show that not only had food spoilage been a thorn in people's sides literally from the beginning of human communities, but also humans had been dedicated to find a way of combating that same spoilage for about the same time. Louis Pasteur was part of a long lineage of scientists and thinkers that have been concerned with the food we place in our bodies for centuries. Now we have laid all that groundwork, let's move on to Monsieur Pasteur himself, shall we? Louis Pasteur was born in Dole, France, on December the 27th, 1822. He earned a Bachelor of Art degree in 1840 at only 18, and a Bachelor of Science degree in 1842 from the Royal College of Besancon. He then went on to earn a master's degree in science in 1845 and a doctorate of science in 1847, which is an impressive array of qualifications by the age of just 25 years old. From there, he moved from student to teacher as he became the professor of chemistry at the University of Strasbourg. It was in 1854 when Pasteur had moved to become the Dean of Sciences at the University of Lille. In 1857, when he returned to Paris to become Director of Scientific Studies at the École Normale Supérieure, we really begin to see his work turning towards the prevention of food spoilage. What is interesting in hindsight is that while the majority of people today would think of milk as being the key product associated with the word pasteurization, for Louis Pasteur himself, it was the spoilage of alcohol, and particularly wine, that was the key concern. In 1862, he conducted an experiment by boiling and cooling beef broth in a flask with a swan neck which was long and curved. His experiment showed that while the air cooled the liquid, microorganisms entered the swan neck and were trapped in the bend, but the liquid itself was not touched by these organisms. His success with this experiment led to a commission from the Emperor of France himself in 1863. Emperor Napoleon III requested that the famous scientist look at the ailing French wine industry, which across the board was experiencing issues that made the wine sour and bitter. Pasteur came to the conclusion, quote, There may not be a single winery in France, whether rich or poor, where some portions of the wine have not suffered greater or lesser alteration. End quote. In trying to solve the French wine industry's problems, Pasteur developed a procedure by heating wine between 55 degrees Celsius and 60 degrees Celsius. That's between 131 degrees Fahrenheit and 140 degrees Fahrenheit to protect the wine from disease. Interestingly, the technique he used was similar to that which had been used by Chinese winemakers since around the year 1117. As an aside, when done properly, heating wine during the pasteurization process should not alter the wine's flavour, particularly when wine is heated with as little oxygen as possible. Pasteur's study took two years to complete, and after he had finished, the emperor invited Pasteur to spend time at the royal residence, Chateau Campienne, to explain his successful findings. This led to Pasteur's publication of a major work called Études sur le vin. It became a classic textbook for the wine industry and one that would change the business forever. His solution to the problem of the wine industry was to show that it was microbes that were the cause of that problem and heating the wine to a specific temperature killed them. What is interesting in today's wine market is that very little wine is now pasteurized. These days, it is rarely needed, particularly for wine that will need the living organisms of the wine to develop with age. However, a relatively new system known as flash détente has been developed in France and is now being used in some of the winemaking areas around the world, including the USA. Flash détente is a quick way of pasteurizing where the grape stems are removed, 
the grapes are crushed, and the grapes put in a flash detente machine, which would heat the mash for three minutes at 180 degrees Fahrenheit, then transfer to a vacuum where it is cooled quickly. Initially, flash detente was seen as being of value to producers who had issues with certain sites on their vineyard that were subject to diseases or lack of ripening. But more recently, it has been used by other producers too to help speed the winemaking process along. For Pasteur, however, there was still much work to do in the nearly 30 years until he was to pass away in 1895. He turned his attention to many other concerns. He turned his knowledge to the local beer industry. He later became the unexpected saviour of the French silk industry. He was able to show that it was the microorganisms that were responsible for the rising number of deaths of the silkworm population, and then was able to create a process that preserved healthy silkworm eggs. He was also one of the founding fathers of the practice of immunology, which with this pandemic is something that is very much on our minds right now. Starting in 1879, he developed a vaccine for a disease known as chicken cholera, and starting in 1881, he developed a vaccine for anthrax. In 1885, he created the first vaccine for rabies, which propelled him to even more fame. In 1888, the Pasteur Institute was inaugurated after an international campaign. It is still running now and shows why this remarkable man was and is considered one of the greatest scientists in human history. It is also worth noting at this point that according to our friends at the UCLA Department of History, his wife Marie participated in the experiments Louis was known for, but is rarely recognised. So here's to Louis and Marie. As I mentioned before, despite all of this incredible work by Pasteur and the fact that the process of heating to destroy microorganisms will forever bear his name, the ingredient that is perhaps most associated with pasteurization was not one that he tackled. That is, of course, the ingredient of milk. The credit for pasteurizing milk goes to a German agricultural chemist by the name of Franz van Soxlet, who in 1886 first suggested that the new process be used on milk before it was sold to the public. It was a good suggestion, as to that point, many diseases such as typhoid, diphtheria and tuberculosis could all be carried to human beings by drinking milk. In fact, in the United States at this point, nearly a quarter of all infants who died in New York City did so because of drinking milk that had been tainted. This changed to 1 in 14 once the practice of pasteurization became commonplace. In fact, the quality of milk in New York City and New Jersey was so notoriously bad, not just because, as an article in the Smithsonian Magazine put it, quote, In the 1880s, an analysis of milk in New Jersey found the liquefying colonies of bacteria to be so numerous that the researchers simply abandoned the count. End quote. Yuck. It was also because of the unscrupulous practices of the dairy people themselves. They used chalk or plaster dust to alter the colour to a brighter white. They also sometimes added pureed calf brains to cream to create a yellow colour. And if the milk began to sour, they would add a drop of formaldehyde to the liquid, which would stop the decomposition. So common did this become that scandals were named in the press as another embalmed milk scandal. It was not until the 1930s that pasteurization had become a federal law in the United States. And even then, it faced challenges from some doctors of the time who believed that heating milk would remove all of its beneficial properties and even lead to scurvy. This argument continues even now in the United States, nearly a 100 years later. The raw milk enthusiasts claim that with better production techniques and the decline of diseases that used to be carried in milk, drinking raw milk is not an issue and is, from a health point of view, better for you. Whereas there are many on the side of the health professionals that say that the possibilities for contamination during milking are still frequent and there is generally no difference between the milk that is pasteurised and milk that is not in terms of health benefits, so why take the risk? Which I think is a good point at which to bring this episode to a close. So I hope you enjoyed it. 
this look at two great scientific discoveries from food history. Do let me know what you think, and perhaps in Season 9 we can look at doing some more. Okay, see you next week, folks. Do make sure to check out the website associated with this podcast at www.eatmyglobe.com where we will be posting the transcripts from each episode along with all the references and resources we use putting the episodes together in case you want to delve deeper into each subject. There is also a contact button, so please do let us know if there are any subjects that you would like us to cover. And if you like what you hear, please don't forget to subscribe, recommend us to your family and friends, and give us a good rating on your favourite podcast provider. That really makes a difference. Thank you, and goodbye from me, Simon Majumda. And we'll speak to you soon on the next episode of Eat My Globe, a podcast about things you didn't know you didn't know about food. The Eat My Globe podcast is a production of It's Not Much But It's Ours and Producer Girl Productions. <laughs> and is created with the kind cooperation of the UCLA Department of History. We would especially like to thank Professor Carla Pastana, the Department Chair of the Department of History, and Dr Tawny Paul, Public History Initiative Director, for their notes on this episode. Also, a huge thank you to Sybil Villanueva for her help with the research and the preparations of the transcripts for this episode, which can be found on the website.